In the highly materialistic Western worldview of today, there are people who have profound mystical experiences. Mystical experiences that humans have had for eons. Mystical events, such as feeling the warmth of unconditional love from a higher source. The same feeling of unconditional love commonly reported during near-death experiences. However, these modern-day mystics have found themselves isolated. Isolated on the margins of society with no embracing community to share the revelations. One such modern-day mystic is Dr. John Stone, who early on had an anomalous experience of timelessness. The first time I had a mystical experience, I think, was in my 20s. It, it was very brief. Um, I remember it was as if time stopped. There was no past, there was no future, and it lasted just a short while, and I was I wondered what it was. It didn't go anywhere, you know, it didn't lead to anything. Um, but I was always curious about that. Many more such experiences and revelations soon followed for John. But when he tried to communicate what he learned to spiritual and martial arts communities, he was met with blank stares. I, I, I tried to find a place where I could go where other people would understand and they'd, they'd have the same, they'd, they'd be in kind of in the same ballpark. And I found that when I started, when I would try to talk about it, uh, uh, they, they, I couldn't find any way for them to, to, get, to get it across to them. So John was invited to sit in a series of interviews conducted by producer Ronald Meyer for a movie about people who had near-death experiences. This is what happened when he was able to interact with these near-death experiencers. Well, I just wanted to, uh, to mention that one of the reasons I'm sitting in is my experiences have ten tended to be in the direction of the discovery of, of the divine, of God, if you will. Yeah. It's just to use a word, but I, I had a big waking experience 30 years ago. And before the, just before the experience, I was expecting you know, some sort of void experience. You know, that's what I was going for, void, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff. Instead, I got uh, something that I loved deeply, which was me and which was everything. And I just didn't know what to do with it. So I started calling it you to give it a name and I wrote all these poems about you and I just didn't know where to put it. And it took me it took me a while to, to get all to get it more or less integrated. But I realized that you know the world that I felt most comfortable in was the world of uh, mystics. But then I don't feel comfortable in the re the religious world in which that mystics live. Yes. So it was very hard for me to find a com uh, com yeah. community. But when I read, uh, not that I'm an NDE -er, but when I read the NDE experiences it, aha, that's what I've experienced. Though I haven't experienced yes. the tunnel and everything, but the whole, the whole idea of, uh, of universal love and of a loving being, which is us and more than us, I identified with it, which is one of the reasons why Ron went into the NDEs. I told Ron about this and he said, this is really cool. Excellent. And he decided to, pursue it on his own, and that's why I'm here, because of that connection. Very... <sighs> Perfect. A mystical experience is a person's profound, often transformative encounter. An encounter characterized by a deep sense of union or communion with the divine or ultimate reality. It's well documented that mystical experiences can occur spontaneously or be induced through practices like meditation, prayer, or ascetic disciplines. 
In fact, mystics and mystical experiences have profoundly influenced or even founded many of the major religions, have shaped the core doctrines of these religions. For example, the revelations experienced by prophets like Moses, and practices of Judaism, Jesus and Christianity, Muhammad and the face of Islam, and the Buddha, and the practices of Buddhism. The insights gained by mystics during their experiences are frequently recorded and become key components of religious teachings, influencing the beliefs and practices of millions. Mystics often emerge as social reformers. Their profound experiences can lead them to advocate for peace, social justice, and compassion towards the suffering. Historical religious figures like Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh religion, set up a unique spiritual, social, and political platform based on equality and fraternal love. And mystics like St. Francis of Assisi, driven by their mystical visions, challenged existing social orders and promoted ideals that led to significant social changes. Beyond strictly religious or social domains, the mystical experiences of certain individuals have influenced art, literature, and philosophy. Most importantly, Greek philosophy, which through mystical revelations laid the foundation for mathematics, science, and democracy. On the other hand, near-death experiences, NDEs, are profound personal events that often occur to individuals who are close to death or who have suffered a severe trauma that brings them near to dying. These experiences commonly include sensations of leaving the body, feeling a deep sense of peace, moving through a tunnel towards a light, encountering deceased relatives or spiritual beings, and a life review. But most importantly, there is an awareness of unconditional divine love. These experiences have lasting impacts on individuals' attitudes towards death and life, but also many times result in the emergence of latent superhuman capabilities. The first Zoom interview John sat in on was with Dr. Julia Asante, who had two near-death experiences. She is the author of the 2012 cutting-edge book on near-death experiences titled, The Last Frontier. I call it the, the, the great heart experience. I was, sitting, I was on a, a retreat and I was sitting on a bench uh, a front where I was, I, and suddenly uh, it was as if my heart emerged from my chest and embraced the, you know, the entire universe. And at that moment, I felt the love that is, you know, everything was loved and held within this heart. Everything was That's right. perfectly held, That's perfectly the loved, exactly as it is. Yeah. And then it kind of, it, then it just like withdrew back into my heart. You know, I was, and I was, I was just sitting there in stunned silence for a while. But, you know, it was a huge heart opening. So ever since then, I've been aware of, of that, that everything is loved perfectly as it is. You know that the, the heart is now known scientifically to have a faster and better, a faster sense of perception than the brain. And it can take in more philosophical information than the brain can. It is a way of knowing. I know that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's also the way out. Because as soon as you get into the heart and if you start to feel gratitude, your whole day is going to change. Your body's going to change. Gratitude is so powerful. Really. That's lovely. I'm glad you told me that. John V. Stone was born in Lockport, New York, and grew up in a large middle-class family in a small town outside of Syracuse. 
where he graduated top of his class from high school in 1965. From there, he went to Yale University, which he attended for two years before spending a year in Norway and then transferring to the University of Wisconsin, where he eventually earned his PhD in Scandinavian studies. In 1971, he met the love of his life, Robin Cooper. They married in 1974, and several months later, began their study of the martial art of Aikido. In 1976, they moved to California, where John taught at UCLA, and where they both continued their study of Aikido. Yeah, well, what attracted me to Aikido, to studying it, was um, I happened to be studying Tibetan at the university, and my Tibetan teacher talked about seeing a film of this little old Japanese guy throwing around a bunch of younger men. And I was intrigued by that. He said the name of the art was Aikido. Um, and I looked it up and you know, found out that the, the founder was very spiritual, it was a spiritual art, and I was kind of intrigued by that. And it just so happened that there was uh, a university club starting that September. And so my wife and I went, and we, that got us going. We were intrigued. I wasn't particularly physically adept at that point, but I, the, the idea that I might actually be able to learn to use my body intrigued me, and then I was also intrigued by the spiritual side. Part of it was also that I wanted to just uh, feel like I was competent. There was this, there was the ego side to it. I wanted to be feel I was competent. I, I feel like I could handle myself, uh, but in a spiritual way. Martial arts across various traditions and styles have a long and rich history intertwined with spirituality and personal transformation. While each martial art has its own unique philosophy and approach, many share common principles that can lead to spiritual growth and transformation. This was particularly true for Aikido, a unique and spiritually oriented martial art. A martial art that was developed in the early 20th century by Morhai Yushiba in Japan. Yushiba, often referred to as O-sensei, or great teacher, who was deeply influenced by his spiritual beliefs particularly those of Shinto, which literally means the way of sacred or divine power. For many people, martial arts is the beginning of a journey along a spiritual path. However, for John, training in Aikido was not enough. When uh, my wife and I lived in Los Angeles in the 70s, and at some point in there, I happened to read an issue of Black Belt magazine where there was an interview with a, a fellow named Peter Ralston. And he talked about having these abilities, and it sounded like he had the kinds of abilities that the founder of Aikido had. And I was very intrigued by that. He was up in Oakland, I was in LA, and I didn't see any way that I could go, I could go train with him. But it just so happened that three years later, three or four years later, when I was in Madison, it turns out that one of his students was living in Madison. I got to know him, and he invited Peter to come to Madison. So I thought, oh, I gotta check this guy out. So I went to see him, and I was immediately taken with what he did. I thought, this is what I wanna do. This is what I thought Aikido was. What he's showing is fluidity of motion and uh, spontaneity. I was just very taken with him, and he, was, he had this ability to explain what he was doing in English instead of using these unusual Japanese terms, which I could never make, understand. So I was drawn to him for his ability to explain and also just his martial ability. Peter Ralston was arguably the greatest mixed martial arts fighter of the late 20th century. But he was also one of the founders of the consciousness movement that began in the San Francisco Bay Area. In 1975, Ralston founded the Chen Ching School of Martial Arts and Consciousness Expansion. In this particular program, for seven months, they're going to be training. Now, they'll be training in the martial domain, mostly, but they'll also be training mind. We'll do different exercises on intention and clarity and being uh, on purpose 
and being honest, and do a lot of contemplation and work through a lot of, as if mental, emotional, spiritual type considerations. And then there's three weeks of martial, in which I'm going through many techniques and unfolding the art of Cheng Shen Tui Shou. We do a little sword and work on the body movement, body being, effortless power, things like that. When we finish that, the people doing the month long go away and the apprentices stay, and I'll continue to work with them. And every day, we will, they will learn something new, some new techniques, work on a principle, uh, day after day after day. And they'll be training these things all day long. We'll also work with mind. From time to time, we'll do intensives in which they have to make some kind of mental breakthrough they have to have a shift in the state of their being in order for us to stop the intensive. These are very rigorous. When everybody makes this shift, we go home. <laughs> if it doesn't, we stay on until they do. It's, just, it's a very rigorous uh, uh, program. And um, the kind of shift is something they have to do. And also the way it's set up is that it's not necessarily easy to do. It's not just something. They have to change something, see? They have to rise to the occasion. <laughs> it turned out that um, the abilities that Peter was talking about in that interview came from uh, taking something called the Enlightenment Intensive. And he had some profound spiritual experiences and then these abilities came along with them um, and I happened to read the interview that he gave uh, about his experiences and I thought ah I want those experiences <laughs> I want those abilities uh, and it turned out after I'd been studying with Peter for a while that uh, there was another side to his he wasn't just teaching martial arts he was teaching what he called consciousness work and part of that he, he did these uh, week-long seminars weekend seminars and he also did something called the contemplation intensive which was three intense days of working on a question very much like a zen retreat and, I, and he said in three days it's possible it actually is his were four days long and the brochure in four days you can have the kind of experiences that the zen guys are talking about and i thought to myself ah i'll give it a try maybe it'll work and that's what led me to to take the first intensive and that changed everything enlightenment intensives seen here began in 1968 when a group gathered in the high desert in southern california to engage in a new form of contemplation a new form of contemplation designed to bring the participants into a direct knowing of the self and reality one of those attendees was 23-year-old Ed Riddle. He had a profound enlightenment experience that first weekend and has gone on to master many enlightenment intensives. He describes the ultimate purpose of the practice. Think of this personality that you have, this one that you are presenting yourself as is, is really the mask. And if you, what, what's the who, who are you that is behind that mask? And that's the, that's the target for uh, your enlightenment quest, is the one that's at the heart of that, the heart of who you really are, you know, it's the one you really, really are. You put a lot of reallys on there, you say really, really, really. And that's, most of us can't get it, just by, you know, in a moment. It takes a process. Some can, you know, some just, they just, they just become spontaneously enlightened. A sudden enlightenment is the hallmark of near-death experiences. Few of us uh, are, are, are aware of clarity. Few of us are really aware of who we really are. And, and the near-death experience takes away all the blinders. It takes away of all the personality cues it takes way of all of this extra stuff and forces us to see and be who we really are. On the first retreat uh, that I took with Peter in 94, uh, 
the question that, that everybody had was, who am I? So we would, we, we worked in pairs, and one person would say, tell me who you are, and the other person would contemplate the question and then communicate whatever came up back to the person listening. We, we alternate cycles like that. We did that about 45 minute cycles of, and then there would be a break and we did 12 of those or something like that. We, did, we still got up at 6 in the morning, went to bed at 11.30 at night. It was pretty intense. And uh, at some point it sank into me, my God, I really don't know who I am. And I just the guy got, whoa, whoa, how could that be? So I became intrigued with the question. Second or third day I had this little, like this feeling of, oh, me. And it was, a, it was this physical thing, this actually this, I could feel this little jolt inside of me. I went, so I went up to Peter and I said, I know I am. And Peter said, who are you? Went, this, I'm this. He said, are you satisfied? And I said, yes. I wasn't totally, but. <laughs> John would go on to take many enlightenment intensives. Eventually, he became a master, putting on his own enlightenment intensives. It was during this time he had numerous mystical experiences. I experienced this rush of energy. It felt like I'd been uh, plugged into a, a big circuit, you know, like this huge rush of electrical energy. It was up my body, I was shaking, and, and I started crying because it was so beautiful what I was aware of. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was me. You know, it's what I want, what I am. But then I started looking around and it was everything. Peter Panagor has had two near-death experiences. His first death occurred in 1980 from hypothermia while ice climbing in Banff Provincial Park in Canada. He died again from a heart attack in 2015. I know that I'm known by the knower. Freezing to death on a mountain and a visit to heaven can do that to a person. But it's not necessary. NDEers are one type of mystic. There are many types of mystical experiences. Maybe you've had one, probably. He's written two books on the near-death experiences, as well as hosting a YouTube channel on the subject. John tells Peter about the feeling sense that has developed as a result of his mystical experiences. Well, I can feel things as if they're in my body. Lately, I can feel them in my heart. That's a shift that it recently, like everything is in my heart already. It's, it's a physical, it's kind of a physical thing. As, as if somehow physically it's contained within me, it's hard to, to describe. I can relate to that because one of the after effects I came back with, because when I was on the other side, my thinking was my being, was my feeling, was my sensing. My, that came back with me. And when I, I see light in people, I feel it in them. I hear it. I taste it. I smell it. It is this singular sense of love that is experiential to me. It's not imaginary. It's not in my head. I feel this and I can feel, I can feel the radiance of the love of the energy inside of the tree, the dog, the chickadee, the child, the stranger. It is a, there's a physicality to it. Okay. One of the gifts I, I, I got was when I truly see something, I love it. Yes, this is this is this is beautiful for you to say because this is exactly the same experience. I I I love these things. I love them with a love that isn't mine. Yeah. It, it's like it's theirs and mine. It's have you ever come across Martin Buber? Is a I haven't read but I know I and thou. I and thou. It's this this and space that is the that where I am. I am the other, and they are me. And when I came back, I, I'm part of the problem of being, for me, being in NDE years, I was falling in love with everybody I met. Like it didn't really matter who they were. I was just like, free love, everybody. I love you, and I love you, and I love you. And it caused me a lot of trouble. <laughs> In 
Yvonne Quezon, MD, had five near-death experiences. In 1994, Dr. Quezon originated and coined the phrase, spiritually transformative experiences. She also has written three books and has created Spiritual Awakenings International, an organization devoted to bringing all spiritually transformative experiences under one umbrella. One, one experience that I've been kind of, I don't quite know how to relate to is the most powerful, emotionally powerful experience in some ways. I was at a retreat. Uh, at the end of the retreat, uh, the, the teacher decided to do this little yo uh, Kundalini yoga exercise on the very last day in the morning, not fast, like the last day, like 6, 6 a.m. I took, participated in it. And then he said, oh, well, just lie down. We did this exercise. We're breathing all of our chakras going up and up and up and up. Um, it's an Osho exercise. You know, I'm doing this, and I don't know what's going on. But it feels good. <clears throat> and he tells us to lie down. And as soon as I lay down, I opened up into an experience I had the day before of intense the, the beauty of everything, what do you call it? What I call the beauty of being. And I just sort of reach, like I reached for it, and, uh, and then everything transformed into this experience of breathing in everything and becoming me, and then breathing everything out and becoming the cosmos. And I did that with every breath. It was, and it wasn't a vision, though I, there was a kind of a visual component to it. It was, that was my experience. Your experience, yes. And it was, I understand. I was so enraptured. It was, and I, I, I felt like I could have, there was more. Mm -hmm. But the retreat came, or later came by and said, so what's going on, John? I opened my eyes and realized I could hardly speak. And I knew I had to leave. So I said, help me, bring me back. I couldn't move at all. But I've, it was sort of like a, a near death experience in a way, or like on the edge of it, but, well, but I, I feel more I, like a mystical. I would call it, I mean, that you're talking to the right person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this book, you would probably really enjoy this book of mine, Touched by the Light. I, this I, is, I, you, know, you read it? Have you read yeah. it? Excellent. Okay. So look up Unitive Mystical Experiences, because that's what I would call your, this was a type of unitive mystical experience. There was no longer any separation between ego self and cosmos. And, and, and there are so many variations on all types of mystical experiences. <laughs> you know, the breathing in, the breathing out, the oneness, the no separation. That's what I would call it, is that you had a, a profound and beautiful type of unitive mystical experience. Mystical experiences are the most powerful, most profound type of spiritually transformative experience. Now, near-death experiences happen to be either a mystical experience or out-of-body experience, because some of them are not mystical experiences, that happen to happen when you're close to death. So then we label it a near-death experience. Now, you have a mystical experience when you're meditating. We call it a mystical experience. You have a mystical experience looking at a sunset. We call it a mystical experience. When you have the similar mystical experience when you're close to death, in North America, we call it the near-death experience. Susan Grau, DD, is an acclaimed author and a globally recognized intuitive medium. At four and a half years old, she had a near-death experience when she was locked in an unplugged freezer in her parents' garage. This experience resulted in profound clairvoyant capabilities, which she continues to develop. So I've had an experience of uh, what I call the great heart, being completely loved and filled, you know, like everything is held in this, the way, the way, the way I see it, it's kind of metaphorically, everything is held in the great heart, which is the heart of God, and it's the way God sees everything perfectly perfectly supported. So I, all of my experiences go along with everything you said, and also about the, the biggest thing that I learned was to love myself. And that in this, you know, in my soul, the center of my soul is the center of God as well. That is the same thing. 
And I see that everywhere now. And then there's everything, not all the time, but <clears throat> yeah, when I stop thinking, I should say. And that's, that's amazing because that's the goal. Yeah, that's what it seemed to be. And as soon as I allowed that, that was the hardest thing to come to, actually. It's the hardest thing we do here. I think that when we do it fully, completely, 100%, we're gone. We're not here. <laughs> I think we can reach it perfectly. For no, sure. That's true. It's not, not perfect, but yeah. there, are moments, there are moments. The goal um, to get on that path. Yeah. You know, and that's that, was, that was the biggest uh, shift that happened to me, was, uh, was that. At first, I saw what I loved outside of myself, and I realized it was inside me and inside everything. Absolutely. It's always an inside job in everything we do. And once we right. recognize that, we can actually heal that inside. Um, I do a lot of shadow work with people, and I see that, and I tell them that all the time. It's it's an inside job. All the other stuff is just junk. You don't need it. You need to love who you are in your journey and understand why you're going through what you're going through. Suddenly in the interview, Susan had a communication from John's father, also named John, who had passed away. He's going to tell me what he wants you to know. So. For instance, John is telling me that he loved his family. He loved his son. He was proud of his son. And he still reminds, remains in pride with his son. That tells me he's a good man who loves his children. That's a given, right, if, if he's saying that. And, and he would probably say something along the lines when it came to his wife is, don't upset your mother. Don't upset your mother. That's going to upset me. Don't do it. And I can feel that energy from him. So that tells me he, he loved his wife. So I'm getting the information and I'm making a decision what they mean by that, by how they're telling me. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time and you take care, John. I do think that was your father. I have a feeling that was your father talking to you and I just had to share it with you. I wrote down your father's here, so I just had to. So I hope that it gave you some peace of knowing he's around you. He does tell me, may I, may I tell you what he's telling me? Sure, I he comes into the corner of your room. There's a picture somewhere. I don't know what room he's talking about, but he comes to the corner of your room where that picture sits. Mm -hmm. And um, if you just will allow yourself to sit in the dark and um, leave right where you are, like right where that picture is in that corner and allow the energy to come in, it will feel like um, what he's telling me. It'll feel like a cloud almost and you'll it'll feel kind of moist and you'll see like a grayish tone moving. And just let yourself be in that. And before you know it, you'll see it coming towards you. That will be your father. Yeah, you know, there is indeed a picture of my father uh, in the co in the corner of the room. I know. In a, pro in a profile, he's, he's uh, getting something from the water. He's down on his, uh, you know, like uh, people in Asian countries sit on their, sit on their haunches. He's sitting like that, and he's got his hands out in the water. I think he's just got a fish or something. He loves to fish. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I told you about him. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, he really wants you to know he's there. Dr. Scott Taylor is an experiencer, academic, and educator who had a profound shared near-death experience that occurred when he joined a young boy in the non-physical world who had just died as he was reunited with his mother, who had passed away a few days before. John tells him about his experience of the void. Along with all these experiences of fullness came the experience of uh, what Ron has also experienced of, of uh, the void of nothing, nothingness. One, one retreat I had, I disappeared. There was no me left. At all. There was nothing left. I was in the middle, midst of a nothing, but I could still see everything. But everything I looked at was nothing. I was nothing. There was no I. I couldn't even, the word I didn't exist. It didn't exist. Yeah. It didn't exist. There was no I. And yet there was, there was awareness. And it was, it was very disconcerting. And later on, I realized it was the same thing as everything. I don't know how I know that. I just knew it one day. At, oh, they're in the same place. They're in the same place. What do you, what, what do you know? It's like, aha. Uh -huh. I don't know how I know that, but I just know that they're in the same place. The form is empty, as empty as this form. It's like, well, duh. It was... 
So it was almost like that. But but I did I, I wrote something once the the open form the open love of emptiness is form the hidden love of form is emptiness. Oh wow! So that kind of says it all. <laughs> sure, that, that's, that that came. It's like there it is. You know, they're they're wedded somehow. Yeah, it's a it's an extraordinary place to be. It's it's my favorite meditative state is is going to that that void that emptiness so the the the, uh, Med the monroe institute was it was, you, you're able the the binaural we Ram and i ron and i have both done binaural beat stuff but the, the, with monroe um courses and so on that, that's possible to to go there yes mm -hmm. and mm. and right away it doesn't doesn't take long well it's thank like, you i've i've been sure i i while i was in i said I, 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 even though there was no I, there was this feeling that something was like I wasn't. It didn't feel complete to me. The, the but then maybe that's just nothing. I don't know. There was something, something about it that was. Yeah, I still don't can quite process. Maybe that was that. You know, I don't know if you ever had the experience. You have an experience, and it's like it, there's something more. I know there's more. And I have that feeling about. That, that there's more that there's more to nothing than nothing. I think that's really interesting because um, in my explorations of this of that space, you know, the second that I think, well, there's more, that means there's an I that's asking this question. And what it what it meant for me was that I had to lose the I in order for me to gain more. I had to lose it. What does it mean for John and humanity that near-death experiences and mystical experiences point to the same phenomenon of our oneness with the divine? So being in an altered state takes away your limiting beliefs. We're out of our thinking. We are not thinking when we're going into the spirit realm. We're, we're using our soul. When we are thinking, we're thinking too hard or we're trying too hard. And when we're thinking, we're doing too much. And so we lose the connection. Now to live in this world, obviously we have to think. And our brain is distorted from every life experience we've ever had. And so unfortunately, we block that spirit connection. So our thinking matters. And to release that would be an altered state like meditation. Meditation is an amazing way, leave um, astral projection, amazing way to leave your body and to actually connect with the spirit world very simply. It's just a matter of how you get there. So again, it's simple, but not easy. And so we have to get to that space and understand it. And, and so we have to learn how do we do that and let go of our thinking? Because the minute we go into thinking, we're back to distortion because we have baggage and our minds, all this stuff doesn't go with us there. Universally, regardless of what people's particular culture or spiritual tradition is, that there are some general principles that will help people to speed their spiritual evolution and to um, uh, enhance a healthy spiritual awakening process. And I would say number one is leading a healthy balanced lifestyle so you know this is we're we're in physical bodies right now you do have to look after your body so you know trying to eat well you know stay away from drugs um get regular sunlight get regular exercise so that your vehicle is healthy then you have the psychological that that um we need to uh live our lives in accordance with the universal spiritual principles, which, you know, if you get it all down, it comes down to the golden rule. <laughs> you know, love one another, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor like you love yourself. And you'll find that there's some sort of version of that in all the great spiritual traditions. And the reason it's there in all the great spiritual traditions is it's actually a spiritual law. And um, that it, 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 it brings us so that our consciousness and our hearts and, and minds are in sync <laughs> with the higher power. I 
touched a washing machine and it exploded. You know, this kind of stuff happens with us. We ruin computers, for instance, and um, that's probably not a good part of, of, of that you take away from a near-death experience, certainly not. But ultimately what they don't identify is the enormous amount of freedom you begin to feel, begin to feel as soon as you die or as soon as you're in a near-death experience type situation that's positive. We have no feeling for freedom of that sort. There's no word for it. And that is the thing that I see in people who have died over and over again. This vastness that's open to them. And near-death experiencers get that. And they also get what's important. And the worst thing going on in this world is this chronic fear of death. It's doing everything. It's, you know, these guys who need to have billions and billions of dollars or whatever, they are afraid of death. They get their bodies frozen, for God's sake. What is all this about? What is about having all these children? So your name goes, you know, it survives. And the fear, fear of death is all over the place. It, it runs every culture at this point. 15 years ago? So, you know, Ron and John, I, I challenge you to do this someday, is go into uh, Google Images and type in, you know, like images of death. And if you could use your way back machine, about 15 years ago, what you would get would be images of the Grim Reaper, you know, in the robe, by the hood, there's no face, there's that great big sigh, that sharp knife, and everything about it is foreboding, and it's malevolent, and it's, it's painful, you're gonna be cut down, and, you know, Everything about that image says that this transition is something to be feared and that you are going to be, you know, taken over by uh, the grim reaper. I mean, this is a grim experience. Do that today and what you're likely to get is the light at the end of the tunnel. That is modern cultural concept of what it is to make our transition it's we move from darkness into light we move from incomprehensible um, meaning here in the physical world to to knowledge and to this loving nature you you are a modern day mystic <laughs> a person who has repeated mystical experiences it's called a modern day mystic. It was very inspiring to sit in on the interviews um, with the near death experiences and mediums and other people uh, that I was able to sit on. Uh, sit in on. Um, it was inspiring and it was also uh, expanding. I, you know, I felt part of a community in the sense that the even though my experiences are rather different. Um, I felt a part of that community. Near-death experience is a, an, a type of mystical experience, but there's this quality that uh, might have in varying degrees different quantity, but the quality of it is the exact same for everyone. Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Meister Eckhart, John Roosbrook, you can long, 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 long list. And that these people are our peers. And that, that one of the things I'm hoping will come out of the NDE community is the opportunity for other people who've had these experiences that are very, very similar. So similar that in their, in their essence, they are the same, can have a voice and speak what they know. Hi, 
I'm Bill Ambrose. If you like this video, subscribe so we can bring you more programming from our studio. Thank you for subscribing.